Our timeline begins in 1491 with the distribution of First Nations in the territory known as the Dominion of Canada. European conquest begins with the arrival of fishing fleets along the eastern coast and exploration seeking a route to China and India. France explores Upper North America. The beaver fur trade was established around 1580. Colonies began settling in 1608 along the St. Lawrence Seaway and New Brunswick. English colonies are founded along the American East Coast. This brings England and France into conflict over ownership of North America. The Hudson's Bay Company is given English charter to economically exploit the area known as Rupert's Land. Trade ties with First Nations are developed to provide animal furs for the European markets. Alliances are built between the European powers and some First Nations. The English, working with the Iroquois, and the French, with the Algonquin, fought wars involving both European troops and their First Nations allies over control of land and trade. War in Europe over the Spanish royal succession involved concessions in North America. In defeat, France recognized English title to Rupert's Land, Newfoundland, and Acadia. The Far West is recognized as open to traders of all nations. Wolfe defeats Montcalm on the Plains of Abraham. The Treaty of Paris is signed in 1763, where France cedes North America to Britain. The Royal Proclamation provided legal protection for both the French colonists and First Nations under the British Crown. Central to the Royal Proclamation was the separation of lands from those forming French and British parts of North America as an Indian reserve and formally recognizing that First Nations had the right of occupation of the land. The proclamation also implemented a process whereby First Nations lands could be purchased by the Crown through treaty for British settlement and development. The American Revolution ended with the 1783 Treaty of Paris. Britain cedes land below the Great Lakes to the United States of America. A war is fought over the land west of the Mississippi River between Britain and the United States, with different First Nations fighting on each side. Supporting the British, Tecumseh fights for return of the Indian Reserve lost to First Nations during the American Revolution. First Nations, friendly to the British Crown, move north of the border into Upper Canada. The London Conventions establish boundaries between the United States and Great Britain from the Great Lakes to the Rocky Mountains. The Hudson's Bay Company merges with Northwest Fur Trading Company. The Oregon Treaty cedes Oregon and Washington State to the United States. While the First Nations in the East began to be assimilated into European culture, the Western tribal groups continued with their traditional ways of life and developing an economic partnership with the Hudson's Bay Company. The First Nations of Eastern Canada were eager to educate themselves and their children with European technology. At the request of chiefs, schools were set up where populations warranted. In 1831, the Mohawk Residential School was opened in Brantford to provide education opportunities for First Nations in Ontario. The British government had its own ideas of what it wanted for the education of First Nations people. As well, assimilation of Indians into mainstream society was beginning to be discussed. The Bagot Commission Report of 1844 proposed that the separation of children from their parents would be the best way to achieve assimilation. In 1847, Egerton Ryerson, Superintendent for Education, recommended that First Nations education focus on religious instruction and on agricultural training. Meanwhile, the British Canadian colonies continued to grow. 
treaties were signed by the British Crown to provide more land for the settler immigrants in Upper Canada. The Douglas Treaties are negotiated between 1850 and 1854, transferring to the Crown areas on Vancouver Island. In the province of Canada, all adult Indian males who can speak, read, and write English or French will be enfranchised and renounce their Indian status and become feudal British subjects. The British North America Acts incorporated Canada as a nation with federal responsibility for First Nations and land reserved for First Nations. Health, education, and resource management were given to the provinces. In the first federal election, only a small percentage of the population could vote. Voters were men with real property of value. Women, Negroes, and First Nations were not allowed to vote. The Act for the Enfranchisement of Indians creates categories of compulsory enfranchisement, with resulting loss of First Nations status for many. Louis Riel leads the Métis in Manitoba as the Hudson's Bay Company turns over Rupert's land to Canada. This is conditional on Canada entering into treaties with First Nations before legal ownership is achieved. Manitoba joins Canada in 1870. Louis Riel goes into exile in the United States. British Columbia joins Canada under altered conditions of confederation. Between 1871 and 1876, treaties were signed across the prairies along the southern border, giving land access between British Columbia and Canada. The Dominion Lands Act encourages European settlements in the prairies by giving 160 acres of land to settlers who will live on the farm and cultivate at least 40 acres. The federal government combines previous legislation and new laws into the Canadian Indian Act covering all the territory the federal government controls. First Nations people become wards of the state. Traditional village organization is replaced by a band council structure. The federal government defines delivery of education for First Nations youth separate from the provincial responsibility. A superintendent general is set up to oversee Indian agents in a federal department. Indian agents oversee and control all aspects of First Nations life and freedoms. The Davin Report recommends the creation of a system of industrial schools where First Nations children can be sent to remove them from their parents' influence and teach the children English culture. By 1880, 11 industrial schools were operating in Canada. The Canadian federal government authorizes the implementation of residential industrial schools throughout the West. In this year, potlatch and gatherings are outlawed under the Indian Act. Education of children is given in large part to church-run residential schools. Laws are introduced limiting First Nations people in fishing, hunting, and other food gathering activities. The Transcontinental Railroad was completed across the treaty lands of the southern prairies. Land was transferred by British Columbia to the control of Canada to allow rail access to Port Moody. British Columbia First Nations treaties remain unsigned. Louis Riel leads the Métis and seeks the support of the First Nations over grievances of land ownership and government treaty obligations. The Canadian government declares the Northwest in rebellion. Troops are sent quickly using the Canadian Pacific Railroad to put the rebellion down. Defeated at Batoche, Riel is hanged, Poundmaker jailed. Pass laws are brought into effect. First Nations could not leave the reserve without a pass. Passes are issued by Indian agents. The federal government enters into formal agreements with Christian churches to operate residential schools. 
Duncan Campbell Scott becomes Deputy Superintendent General of the Department of Indian Affairs. His stated objective was assimilation. He led the department until 1932. By 1896, 45 residential industrial schools are operating in Canada. Between 1899 and 1930, the federal government signed treaties in the northern areas of the Prairies, Yukon, and Ontario. In 1912, the district of Ungava was transferred to the province of Quebec, subject to the government signing treaties with First Nations. The Northern Quebec Agreement was finally signed in 1975. Opposition parties criticized government overspending on industrial schools. In response, the Minister of Indian Affairs states, it has never been the policy of the department for the design of industrial schools to turn Indian pupils out to compete with whites. The government changes policy, whereby industrial schools would now focus exclusively on agriculture. Aboriginal boys would become handy all-round farmers, and Aboriginal girls would learn the skills to become excellent housekeepers. The Northwest Territories are divided to become the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and portions added to Manitoba. In another amendment to the Indian Act, First Nations can be removed from reserves located near or within towns of more than 8,000 inhabitants, further isolating First Nations from mainstream society. Dr. Bryce, medical inspector, delivers a report on residential school students' health. Portions are suppressed as they reflect badly on the department. Mortality rates at some schools ranged from 30% to 60% over a five-year period. In 1919, Duncan Campbell Scott abolishes the post of medical inspector for Indian residential schools. In 1922, Dr. Bryce published a complete report on these findings entitled, A National Crime. The Grand Trunk Pacific Railway completes its northern route across the Prairie Provinces from Winnipeg to Prince Rupert. All Western Aboriginals must seek Indian Affairs permission through the Indian agents before appearing in Aboriginal costume in any public dance, exhibition, or pageant. Wars break out between the European states, eventually becoming global. More than 3,500 status First Nations sign up and serve in the Canadian Expeditionary Force in France. First Nations children between age 7 and 15 are legally forced to attend residential and industrial schools. Police officers are obliged to arrest the children and take them to the schools. The students in residential schools spent half of their school day on academic subjects and the remainder doing manual work and receiving religious instruction. Since many schools were chronically underfunded, many students found themselves applying their skills in ways that subsidize the schools. An amendment to the Indian Act prohibits anyone soliciting funds for Aboriginal legal claims without special license from the Superintendent General. Indian agents had power over the status First Nations people and exercised it with the intent of keeping the people quiet and on the reserve. Troublemakers could be denied passes to get off the reserve or put in jail. The Supreme Court of Canada determines that Inuits are to be classified as Indian and that the departments that managed Northern Affairs would also manage Inuit Affairs. At least 3,000 status Indians, including 72 women, enlisted, as well as an unknown number of Inuit, Métis, and other natives. At least 17 decorations were earned, including Tommy Prince, who received the Military Medal for Bravery. The federal government begins to apply provincial curriculum standards to residential schools and to integrate Aboriginal students into regular schools. 
status First Nations are permitted to vote in British Columbia's elections. New Indian Act amendments in 1951 removed the restrictions on potlatch, gatherings, and feast laws. Large groups and family could gather again under the new law. The restriction on funding First Nations legal claims was removed. It was noted that after 100 years of residential schools and with 10,000 students enrolled that year, it had become apparent First Nations people were not being assimilated into mainstream Canada. Further, the level of education in these schools was far below Canadian standards. A policy of integration was now proposed as the best way to proceed as the residential school curriculums was reformed to meet new national standards. The schools were slowly being replaced by reserve day schools. In 1960, Status First Nations in Canada were permitted to vote in federal elections. The partnership between the government and churches was brought to an end. All remaining residential schools come under federal control. By 1979, 1,200 students remain enrolled in 12 residential schools across Canada. With the repatriation of Canada's new constitution, the Act recognizes the British Crown responsibility to protect existing Aboriginal and treaty rights. The last Indian residential school closes in northern British Columbia. The Order of the Oblates of Mary Immaculates apologize for their role in the Indian residential school system. The Caribou Tribal Council publishes the impact of the residential school, which contributes to the framework for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. The Anglican Church of Canada apologizes for their part in residential schools. In 1993, the territory of Nunavut was formed through treaty negotiations with the Inuit people. The Presbyterian Church apology to residential school survivors is adopted by their General Assembly. A former supervisor of the Alberni Indian Residential School pleads guilty to 16 counts of indecent assault against students and is sentenced to 11 years in prison. Bishop Hubert O'Connor is convicted of sexual assault arising from his time as principal of St. Joseph's Mission. The final reports of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples is released. It calls for a public inquiry into the effects of residential schools upon generations of First Peoples. The last band-run Indian Residential School, Gordon Indian Residential School in Saskatchewan, closes in 1996. The United Church apologizes to former students, their families, and communities for their part in the Indian Residential School system. In 2000, the Niska Nation of British Columbia signed treaty with the federal and provincial government for their land rights. The Aboriginal Healing Foundation is established with funding by the federal government. Assembly of First Nations National Chief Phil Fontaine announces a class action lawsuit against the Government of Canada over the legacy of the residential schools. Royal Canadian Mounted Police apologize to the First Nations for their role in the Indian residential school system. In 2006, the federal government, legal representatives of former students, the Assembly of First Nations, Inuit representatives, and churches signed the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. The Canadian federal government issues a formal apology to the survivors of the Indian Residential School System. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission begin hearings across Canada. <laughs>